Hi, this is Randy Finney with the Right Side of the Chart, and today is Tuesday, August 19th, 2014. Uh, this video, I wanted to do a, a little bit different format than I normally do. Typically, I'll, I'll cover either the U.S. equity markets, looking at different uh, uh, some of the broad indices, drilling down on different time frames, really digging into the charts there. Uh, at times, I'll cover international markets or maybe do an entire video on a on a sector or industry that I'm bullish or bearish on and look at some trade ideas within that sector. However, today I wanted to just focus on the uh, you know the three main themes that I'm looking at in 2014. Uh, in fact, you know these have been the, my focus throughout the year going into 2014 and will remain uh, my focus through the end of the year. And those three themes are the gold and silver stocks, the mining sector, uh, gold and silver, the metals themselves. You know, I've made a bullish case um, heading into the end of 2013 and uh, throughout the year, you know, I've continued to maintain a, a longer term bias uh, and had a lot of coverage on the gold and silver mining stocks and a lot of trade ideas. Uh, the, uh, the next theme, I've continued to warn, uh, you know, of some building divergences and deteriorating breadth in the broad markets and uh i at this point despite the rally over the last few days and and you know the threat of a lot of the u.s indices breaking out to new highs i remain uh bearish on the broad markets going into year end um, still do not have any official trade ideas in other words i am not shorting the market and for the first time since the inception of right side of the chart back in January 1st of 2012, this is only year that I've not put out any trade ideas, uh, any recommendations or official trade ideas to short the broad markets via, you know, the SPY or the Qs. And personally, I'm not doing that. This has been a grind higher market. Uh, there have been quite a few successful short trade ideas, but you have to be very selective, or at least that's my my strategy now overall i do think by the end of the year uh, there's a good shot that the markets will close in you know negative territory for the year and at the very least have a uh, deeper correction uh, considerably deeper correction than the one that we just had recently uh, by the close of the uh, fourth quarter by the end of the year so i'll talk on that a little bit more and then finally the third theme, at least heading into the tail end of the year, you know, we have just over a month left in the third quarter here. Uh, and as we head into the fourth quarter, I'm really starting to warm up to select commodities. And again, just like the broad market trading long and short, I'm being very selective. I think this is a stock picker's market without a doubt uh, this year in 2014, and I think it will be going forward. The same story holds true with the commodities. I don't think you can, uh, you know, I can make a case, and if I have time in this video, I'll do it. Uh, you know, I see a lot of commodity sectors that look quite bearish, uh, and then others that look, you know, quite bullish. Um, you know, some of those sectors uh, I'll talk on. Some of those are already trade ideas on the site, such as corn, uh, wheat, you know, uh, select soft commodities. And then I'm also, you know, there's quite a few coal ideas, and I've, I've made a case for the coal sector possibly bottoming here soon, as well as rare earth, the rare earth stocks. Uh, so those are some of the things that I'm looking at in the commodity arena. So let's go ahead and start out with the uh, gold and silver uh, mining stocks, gold and silver metals themselves. What we're looking at here is a daily, I'm sorry, this is a weekly chart. This is a chart I've had up for going on a year now, at least uh, on the live links page. This is the weekly chart of spot gold prices. And uh, hopefully you're viewing this video in full screen view, uh, size. Uh, and you can make out this chart. Uh, this is October going all the way back to 2002. Uh, or actually 2001, with the lows here, just before the uh, beginning of 2002. So this is a long-term trend line. And again, for those of you who follow the site, you're familiar with this chart. When gold was up here approaching this trend line, that was my downside target. We hit, you know, we made a, at the time, a 61.8 Fibonacci retracement off this major reaction low back here. So it was really nice timing to hit this long-term uptrend line. Uh, these blue if you can make out the the light blue lines you know back when i had drawn this scenario and prices were still above this trend line i had you know drawn some an arrow 
showing, uh, you know, us hitting that at level and bouncing up, which we have done. Also predicted that we'd have at that time if we did hit it, which we did, had positive divergence form. So again, this was uh, what has played out nicely as we put in that strong positive divergence, very strong divergence uh, on the weekly chart. Uh, gold has bounced, uh, had a nice bounce off the trend line in the beginning of the year, made for some very nice trades. Uh, as posted then, uh, booked a lot of profits personally. We recycled in, we caught that second bounce, you know, scaled back in. So we've had two nice moves up in the metal itself. And as I stated, we're still not clearly out of the woods. If you look at where gold is, although we are above that uptrend line, which is healthy uh, at this point in time, you know, there's still the possibility of a triple bottom. We have this mid-2012 low in the uh, late 2013, uh, or late 2012, December 31st, 2012 low. And, um, you know, there's a possibility for a triple bottom. And if we go much lower below those lows, that will have taken out this long-term secular bull market uptrend line, which would be the first bearish technical event. And, of course, to see a solid, you know, monthly close below those uh, 2012 mid and, and late 2012 lows. I'm sorry, 2013 lows. I'm trying to talk fast here. Uh, that would be a obviously a bearish event. But for now, everything looks good. Things are playing out as expected. Um you know, it, it, all along, you know, I've maintained my preference when bullish on gold or silver or both is to play the mining stocks as they are technically a leveraged play on the metals. Uh, so with gold up, you know, I didn't crunch the numbers. Uh, I should do that, but I don't have it in front of me. You know, gold is up decent for the year. I think we're it's beating the broad market. Um but uh, we have GDX, and this is you know, as of today through yesterday. The GDX, the gold mining ETF, is up 23% year-to-date. The GDXJ, the junior miner, is up 34%. And the SIL, which are, is the silver miners ETF, is up 27%. So those are the gains year-to-date. And for those of you who follow the trades, you know, We've timed, we've been able to time, get in early on the moves. Uh, the big initial run up from uh, early January exited, booked profits on a lot of those trades near the top, scaled back in, caught that next rip up, uh, posted taking booking profits again, stepping away from that recent consolidation range. And only about uh, a week or so ago, just over a week ago, uh, I've added back pretty much my full exposure to the mining sector. And so far, uh, the gold stocks and even the silver stocks are holding up well. I'm a little little concerned about silver itself. Uh, the metal uh, is lagging somewhat, although the silver stocks are, are holding up surprisingly well. Uh, do keep in mind, for those of you that trade the GDX and the, and the SIL, there's a lot of overlap. You know, Very few mining companies mine only gold or only silver. If they're going in the ground... In a lot of places, these metals are found together. So when you look into it, many of the miners in the GDX or in the SIL uh, pull both gold and silver out of the ground. So there's going to be a lot of overlap and a lot of correlation. So, uh, you know, overall, I'm more bullish on gold than silver. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that the uh, silver mining stocks have actually, at least the SIL ETF has actually outperformed GDX year to date. Although keep an eye on it because, again, silver is not doing so hot here. Uh, much more of an industrial component to silver than gold. and uh, uh, But for now, everything looks good, and uh, it's nice to see the miners holding up, even with the recent uh, weakness in silver and in gold prices. So that's the numbers year-to-date. Now let's compare that to the market. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so I said 23% year-to-date in GDX, 34% GDXJ, 27% in SIL. And that compares to a year-to-date gains in the S in the uh, S and P 500 of only about five and a half percent. The Qs are up about eight percent year-to-date. That's the Nasdaq 100, with the Nasdaq itself up only about five and a half. Mid caps, mid cap index up about seven percent, and the small caps or the IWM, Russell 2000, only about three uh, percent. So all in all, the markets, although they you know, we have some modest gains, but we're almost, you know, in a trader's book, in my book, that's about flat for the year, you know, having, you know, going into 
the middle August here and, and, you know, with the, on average, the broad markets being up, you know, 5%, uh, that just goes to speak that it's been much more of a trader's market than a buy and hold market. And, um, again, my, my outlook for the remainder of the year, despite the recent action over the last few days, you know, I occasionally will turn on the TV. I try not to and pick up the papers. Um, but a lot of people saying this is a Super Bowl market. That's all, that's all that we're going to see for that correction. And I think that was just the initial, you know, thrust down and I'll, I'll talk on that here. Let's, let's go ahead and move on. This is the GDX uh, daily chart. Uh, lately, I've been focused a lot on the 60-minute and the 120-minute chart, and I've been posting that on the site. Uh, this is the one that's available via the live links page. Uh, and what we see here, pardon all these annotations and notes, but uh, where where the cursor is right here, this is the beginning that that early the strong rip in the beginning of the year once gold found support on that weekly uptrend line. You know, a lot of the uh, price targets on the uh, some of the trades, some of the earlier price targets were hit on gold. And as I mentioned, I, you know, booked profits up around here, scaled out of those positions, scaling back in, and then you know, catching uh, the bulk of this rip, taking profits most recently up here. And just really sidestepping this consolidation range. As I mentioned, I had no interest in shorting the stocks, but I, I made a strong case for at least a pullback or consolidation. And that's what we've had months of consolidation. However, it is nice to see, you know, the uh, gold stocks holding up, especially in spite of the metal. If you compare that, I won't overlay it right now, but you can look at a chart of gold and especially silver, uh, and you see some weakness in the metals. And the miners are, are holding up, which indicates that they've uh, really seem to be quite sold out. I mean, they've, they've come off a vicious bear market. But as I state, you know, ultimately the miners will follow the metal. So we have to keep an eye on that just because the uh, miners are holding up now, uh, especially with the weakness in silver. Doesn't mean they'll continue to hold up. Uh, especially if silver continues to fall and, and breaks below support. But right now the metals are comfortable. I've already talked uh, ad nauseum about the support levels I'm watching in gold and and uh, I need to do an update on silver. But right now we're okay. And going forward, I still like this these, these trade ideas as long-term trades. And when I recently positioned back into the miners in the last week or two, you know, I'm looking for the next major leg up if I'm not stopped out. Uh, and the first bullish event would be to take out this R2 level here. We have a reaction high in this rea earlier reaction high back in March. Um, ultimately, when we see this T3 level up here go, you know, we had highs back in uh, mid-2013, a uh, big gap there. Uh, at that point, if and when we get there on GDX, that uh, looks to be about the 3150 or so level. Um, again, I should be looking at the gold chart as well. I'm more concerned about gold taking out those previous reaction highs, but right now we're looking at GDX and just as with gold, if we take out those previous reaction highs, uh, that's going to be very bullish. And I think, you know, we are looking at long-term trades. And when I say long-term, these are holding periods measured in many months, six months or more, possibly a year or more, very likely a year or more. Um, but for now, let's just wait and see how that goes. And uh, before I leave this chart, again, the important thing to impress upon is the fact how it's been a trader's market, not only in individual equities, uh, but in even in the gold stocks. You know, we talk, I talked about the 23% gains in GDX, 34% in, in GDXJ, and nearly 30% in SIL. Um, you know, personally, my gains overall, you know, far out exceed that, exceed that because I was able to catch the bulk of this rip given I was scaling in here. I didn't catch, I didn't have full positions at the bottom, but I was scaling in, caught the bulk of that. And many of the positions, in fact, probably all of those on average outperformed the GDX over that time period. And then being able to sidestep the correction, get back in, ride it up again, sidestep this consolidation. You know, that's what trading's all about. So if you really were to you know, take those gains, it it's far exceeds the year to date, you know, 20 to 30% gains in, in the miners. And, um, and that, that's what trading's all about. There are markets such as this bear market in GDX where you could have just shorted the GDX and held on. And, you know, that's, that's when a buy and hold strategy works. 
Um, you know, in the last couple of years, we've had a buy and hold in the broad markets. It's favored buy and hold investment style. We had a straight grind up in the markets. But again, I don't believe that to be the case going forward. Okay, that's the first part. You know, I'll probably have spent more time on gold stocks because that's still my, you know, my primary focus has been and will be throughout the, you know, going forward at least uh, on the gold stocks. Now let's talk a little on the broad markets. This is the S&P 500 weekly chart. This is available as well on the live chart links page. Um, this chart just speaks volumes to me. It, uh, you know, it's very, this is a clean chart. What we're looking at here is the bull market. This this is the March 2009 lows here. This uptrend line uh, is generated off the, the, um, uh, the bull market lows back in March of 2009. And we've had multiple touches of that line. If you look at the breaks below, those are always on an intra-week basis. We're looking at candlestick uh, wicks or tails here, um, you know, shadows or tails. And we had a couple breaks, including the most recent one. Now, I know you probably can't make that out on this chart. I would have to expand it. Uh, maybe I can do that here. Let's see if I don't botch this up. Nah, it's not going to work. Not with this screen software, unfortunately. Stock charts doesn't have a easy zooming feature. So, but if you if you take a look at this chart, go ahead and the live chart links page. It'll open up into a larger size, and you can scroll and pan around. Um, we just this last week we had an intra-week break. Um, I did think that break was going to have some follow through to the downside. We hit my initial targets on the 60 minute charts right at the lows and bounced from there. I pointed that out. So, you know, the fact we bounced was by no means a surprise. Uh, you know, I could have foreseen the possibility of breaking down and moving through, uh, continuing lower. But so far, the positive divergences on the 60 minute chart have played out and continue to play out. Uh, what I had mentioned on this chart here, these notes say what's different this time around, you know, early on, like all bull markets, in the beginning of the middle of the bull market, we have very strong, powerful rallies. The momentum carried prices well above this uptrend line. So we had these corrections, uh, you know, that, that, that approach this, this first one here back in 2011, you know, I believe in the NASDAQ, we actually had a technical, you know, a, a correction of over 10%. Uh, I'm sorry, it might have been a 20% correction in an actual bear market, but we had, um, you know, just, just a healthy correction in the S&P 500, and prices had a good way to fall when we finally corrected from this divergent high. If you look up here, up top, the blue lines show negative divergence, and unless I miss something, I've included, and this chart goes all the way back to, you know, 2007, every divergent top that we've had. You can look at the RSI up top, the MACD below, and you know, when we see on a weekly chart these multi-month divergences in every single case in the past, um, at least on this chart, they have played out for a very healthy correction. You know, this one played out, this one came at the top of the last bear market and played out for the, uh, you know, the 2007 to 2009 bear market. I should say it came at the top of the last bull market. Uh, we had this divergent top back here into 2011. Uh, we had a very nice correction off the first first uh, divergent top. And as, as you can see here with this dashed line, we had a second follow-up divergent high, another nice correction. These are very tradable, profitable corrections to trade. And in each time, again, we were quite a ways above the primary uptrend line. So when the correction started, by the time prices got down there, we were very oversold and prices had made a healthy correction. Now, where are we at? We're over five and a half years into a, you know, an aging bull market, you know, well into, and in some cases, depending on the time frame you're looking at, past the average duration of a bull market. And if you look at this, you know, where prices were wedging up here, they're really hugging the uptrend line. Uh, in other words, we don't have these large rallies off it now. So, you know, each time we are correcting, we're correcting from much closer levels. And sooner or later, these divergences, and look how powerful they are, they go back, you know, for over a year in this case. And, and each divergence has led to a correction, as you see here. You know, we have had these mini corrections within. 
sooner or later we're going to have a breakdown below this primary uptrend line. And with the number of touches, I think that line's very valid. And again, what we had this last week, we had a break below. Yes, that was a bearish technical event from a daily time frame, but as I often state, you got to look at these weekly charts. And until we have a solid weekly close, especially two candlestick closes below on a weekly basis, uh, once that goes, this primary bull market uptrend line has, has left. You know, where we go from there, do we have to collapse? Not necessarily. We can go back up and back test, but it will be the first sign that the uh, bull market is, is in jeopardy from a technical perspective, the first solid sign that we've had since 2009. So that's where we're at. That's the S&P 500 weekly chart. I also like to watch, this is the OEX, the S&P 100 index. You know, the S&P 500 has the 500 largest companies in the U.S. This is the 100 largest, so sort of a variation of, of the bluest of blue chips within the S&P 500. And here's a very similar, as you would expect, a very similar uptrend line. You know, these divergences mark all the divergent tops that we've had there. The, here's the PPO down here. PPO is very similar to the MACD. Uh, better suited on longer term time frames such as a weekly chart and you can see the shaded gray area show the corrections that we've had following these divergences so you know folks nothing in technical analysis or in trading is a hundred percent you can look back and obviously the more instances you can see of something playing out the higher chance it has a playing out going forward but you know this is you know my trading style is based largely off looking at divergent tops and bottoms uh, which help indicate probable t trend changes and you know we're looking at multi-month divergences as this S as the S&P or the OEX in this case grinds higher waning momentum meaning we're we're hugging closer and closer to that trend line like a tired swimmer cling, clinging to a life raft um, sooner or later, these divergences more than likely will play out. Uh, it's very rare that you don't see them play out for at least a decent correction. And this one red candlestick here, I don't know if you can make that out on your chart. Uh, that was the correction that we uh, had just a couple weeks ago. That, that to me, is not commensurate with the long-standing multi-month divergences. In other words, I think there's uh, more to come. Now, whether we bounce for another week, two, three weeks, uh, I think the next correction will be steep enough to take out this uptrend line, such as these prior corrections, which came off divergences that weren't even as steep, you know, and, and, and overbought conditions that weren't as extended as these. Look at the RSI up here, the weekly RSI. Look how long it's remained above the 50 level um, without a dip below that. That is extreme overbought conditions, prolonged overbought conditions. This is when, you know, you get a healthy correction, um, you know, uh, when you see the RSI break down and go below there and even go on to hit the 30 level. We haven't seen that in ages. So this market is, uh, in my opinion, like a powder keg. And I know everything seems rosy now, but when this finally breaks, uh, you know, I think we're going to see a pretty quick and swift correction. And these are target levels. This is the OEX. I mean, at minimum, I would expect us to go down to the 775 level, and we're around 831 right now. So... That's the OEX, and we'll just have to, again, we have to wait for that confirmation for those of you that want to put a swing short on the broad markets. Uh, now, I put up 60-minute charts all the time. You know, had you shorted the last correction, you know, I had that T2 on the 60-minute chart, 120-minute chart on the SPY, which we hit almost perfectly. Positive divergences in place, so a trader, a quick trader, can trade these corrections and can, can go long at those at the bounces uh, but if you're looking to put a swing short on or looking for signs of the next bear market you're just going to have to wait to see not only the s and p 500 but the oex uh, the small caps mid caps you want to see all of these or at least the majority of these trend lines break and i first would look at the s p 500 because it is one of the you know obviously the leading index uh, you want to watch the qqqs and then the secondary or tertiary indexes like the uh, you know, mid caps and small caps, etc. Here's a chart I've put up in the past a couple times in the past few months. This is the OEX from a long-term perspective. Now we're going all the way back. This, start, this chart starts back in 1994. 
and what it shows us are the last three primary um, cyclical bull markets. So we had the, you know, the, again, check the notes on this. I talked about there was a deer market leading up to 1995. So this was actually its own separate bull market. A deer market is when prices pretty much trade sideways for years. It's not a bull market, not a bear market. So the bull market by, you know, at least some definitions, including mine, started back around 1995. Uh, we all know what happened with the dot-com bubble, the NASDAQ bubble popping in, you know, early March of 2000. And uh, what I did are these blue lines, which show the time period. And this is, again, to illustrate, don't look at the steepness of these advances. If you look at the blue line, which I've replicated, I copied that line. That just That is just uh, capturing a certain distance or certain time period. And, uh, and I went from the beginning of each bull market, or the end of the bear market, I should say, the, pre uh, the preceding bear market, and these dotted lines just just follow that uh, horizontal line that I put up and you can see here we're just past the duration the average duration or the actual duration of the last two bull markets now I, I think I added in the last notes on this chart do I did I expect it to play out right on that line absolutely not you know what would the what would the odds be of it playing out you know, within a few days of the last two bear markets. So I figured we'd either fall short or, or go a little past there. And who knows, maybe we go six months, maybe a year. But again, trading is all about probabilities and everything works in cycles. And this is, you know, the business cycle is no different. And everybody gives the Fed 110% credit for this uh, bull market. I don't, I personally think that, you know, the markets work in cycles. We had you know, had a correction, and sure, there was a, you know, a overreaction, a very s swift bear market that we went through with the financial crisis, and a recession, but that's normal part of the business cycle, and then we have economic expansions, uh, which are going to follow a recession, so whether we had a Fed or not, I can guarantee you there would have been an expansion, the world would not have come to an end at this point, um, yes, the Fed's printing money, yes, that makes a uh, can distort the technical somewhat, but at the end of the day, this is the business cycle. We've been in an expansion now in a bull market for over five and a half years, and sooner or later that will come to an end. Uh, as this chart shows, you know, again, I'm not cherry picking and trying to make a case here. There are a few divergences. I didn't mark everyone here. There's a divergence right there, but what I did show is at that five and a half year mark, what they all had in common were both these overbought conditions, the RSI up here and overbought levels, a declining RSI, in other words, divergence. We had these downtrend lines drawn here, the blue downtrend lines on the RSI making lower lows, as well as the PPO making lower lows, i.e. negative divergence leading up to that point. So let's say we were here at this five and a half year mark coming into that, but I didn't see any divergence of the PPO and the MACD or the RSI were looking strong. I might second guess that and say, hey, you know what? This might be one of those cases where we just have a seven or eight plus year bull market. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, that's not the case. Hence the reason for my, my caution in the uh, broad markets, especially going into year end. Okay, and just wrapping up the broad markets, as I said, I'm not going to dig into all the charts, all the different time frames. We just looked at the weekly because I wanted to paint a, a bigger picture and, um, you know, again, make clear that, you know, uh, so far this year, we haven't had any, you know, long term sell signals on the market. We've come darn close. We're right there. As I said, we are literally uh, as much as just a day. We could have one bad day, you know, one 400 500 point down day on the Dow some some event that would put us under that trend line and I also have a lot of trend indicators that are just a stone's throw or a bad day or two away from triggering you know intermediate uh, or more longer term sell signals but again we're not there yet so right now be selective in the broad markets if you're long nothing wrong with that you want to follow the trend trail stops or just keep moving your stops up have stops in place and and don't don't believe for one minute that this bull market is going to go on indefinitely. Um, so just keep an eye out that. 
this is the S&P 500 down below. I should say the green line is the S&P 500. This goes back to 2004. Uh, plotted against the S&P 500 percent of stocks above their 200-day moving average. This is a chart that I've shared in the past. Um, and as we can see here, the again, the green is the S&P 500. The lines here, I'm showing divergent tops. So when the S&P uh, is, is declining in price, I'm sorry, I said that backwards, folks. This is the S&P 500 up top. This is the percent of stocks above their moving average. Okay, so when the S&P 500 is climbing in price and the number of stocks above their 200-day moving average is declining, that's negative divergence. Divergence against, you know, prices making higher highs. And so in this case, we had this divergence and then even a steeper divergence at the end. So that's what I'll refer to as double negative divergence. And then boom, the red arrow was a correction. Now it may not look like much. This is not a log scale. You can do the math if you look over there. I'm sure that was at least, you know, I'm looking at it probably a 50 to 75 point correction in the S&P 500 at least. Next divergent up here. So you, you can take a look. This chart has been posted uh, and you can find that on the site. Uh, the red arrows show the corrections. This one had, we had divergence here. We had one pretty nice correction and then boom, there's the bear market, which came after, you know, a divergent high. So you know, I've gone through this chart and I don't see a single period where we had divergence between the number of stocks uh, above their 200 day moving average and the actual S&P 500 itself. And just about every, well, in every case over this time period in the past, there have been substantial corrections as marked by these red arrows, arrows following those divergent highs. Now, we just had this little, what pe some people are calling a correction, which many are declaring officially over now, last week. I think that's just the beginning, you know, a little shot across the bow, if you will. If you look at this chart, look at the scope of these divergences compared to the other divergences. You know, we haven't seen that in, in quite a while. Uh, so at times, if you look at this one, for example, uh, we had this initial sell-off. Prices pushed back, almost made a new high, then the real correction set in. You know, back in 2007 at the market top here, we had uh, the initial correction, st the 200% the uh, of stocks above the 200-day moving average continued to diverge. They made lower lows. I, I drew the second divergence here. Prices actually made new highs, marginal new highs in the S&P 500. So, you know, at every top I've ever seen the market, and this only makes this it's logical you know market tops either come from new highs um well by definition i'm sorry they always come from new highs if that's a market top but what i often see or rarely see are prices heading straight up and then boom turning around and just falling off a cliff either you see this marginal new high usually a few weeks to a few months later um or you'll see a slightly lower high as you did in this case. This was the peak here. You get the initial correction, a rally back up that falls short of new highs. So I'm open to either possibility here. Um, the S&P is yet to take out new highs. Uh, if and when it does, you know, my expectation is that those new highs will be marginal. So, you know, for a lot of the sectors that I am bearish on now, such as the financials and other things, and I do have you know, selective short positions there. I'm giving those a little room. But as I always say, my stops are based on the individual positions because I'm not shorting the broad market. If I were shorting the S&P 500 or the ES or, you know, the NQ or any, any other instrument now, then my I would have stops based on, you know, whatever those indexes do. Okay, and just to summarize what I said before, remember the stock market year to date, we're up on the S&P 500 about 5.5%. About 8% on the NASDAQ 100, 5.5% on the NASDAQ composite, 7% on the mid caps, and only 3% on the small caps. So all in all, call it about a 5% return on the market. And, um, you know, that's to me, there's been a lot of opportunities, a lot of, you know, we've had some nice pullbacks to trade short on. Um, and we've had quite a few successful longs on the site overall, however, my focus and my personal performance has not been from the broad market. It's been from uh, the gold and silver mining stocks. And then I'll now roll into the next sector 
or uh, theme going forward that I that I'm interested in, and that's uh, select commodity. Okay, let's, this is the DBA, which is the Power Shares Multi Sector Commodity Trust Agriculture Fund. So, in other words, here's your ag ETFs like the corn uh, and wheat longs that I put up. Just like those, you know, I did mention that, you know, the, there are, a trader could take those and put a tight stop under the recent consolidation levels, but I've also showed that they have support below. There's a possibility to break the, the current support levels. In other words, what I'm looking at here to draw this out, let's see if I can get a screen draw on here. Um, yeah, let's see if this will work. You, this is a bullish falling wedge, the blue lines. Obviously, this line labeled support. The green line is support. You have this really nice gap right here. You have this reaction high back here. This is in you know October of 2014. Uh, that gap I mentioned was in looks like February of uh, 2014. My apologies. The previous reaction high before that was October of 2013. Another reaction high. You know, a very nice uh, support level, and. You know, it wouldn't surprise me one bit to see just a little more downside. In fact, it's so small I can't draw it with that arrow, so let's just delete that. Uh, a little more downside possibly to this level. I'll have to try the screen draw again. I'm not very good with this, so forgive me. You know, from, from this level here. Um, now, we could fall shy of that. This is such a nice support level. We have potential divergences. What I want to see, I would like to see this MACD turn up, see a bullish crossover, see the MACD continue to roll over and confirm. What I've drawn here is some positive divergence that I allow for a little bit of downside. Uh, not having a good time with this screen draw feature here. Folks, I need to practice on that a little bit more. but. You know, I can see the possibility of a downside, but I could also see prices turning up here a little shy of that support level um, because this chart looks very bullish to me. Look at the RSI is well above here. So whether we reverse now, people start stepping in to buy a little ahead of the actual support level or we go down and that could take, you know, you have to be patient. I'm not diving in head first into corn, wheat, or DBA or any of these commodities now, but I am scaling in. I do have positions and I'm willing to give room and this is one of those cases where I'll scale in as prices go lower. Some traders refuse to average down on a position. That's fine. Um, I understand that. But if it's part of my trading plan to start getting in because I do see you know, some bullish potential, I'll start scaling in early. Now, I won't be adding below that support level. Um, I might hold the positions a little more. I'll have a stop somewhere below there, maybe that gap. And again, we're looking at DBA. Now, I don't own DBA yet. This is something I'm looking at in the future. Um, and I may start taking some positions, but that's what I'm looking at. We can reverse at any time. We may have to work down over the next few weeks, even the next few months within this bullish wedge. But I'd rather be scaling in towards the bottom of this wedge just above support versus waiting for prices to find support and then break out. I think this is the, the better, more well-defined risk reward because we have both the bottom of the bullish falling wedge. We already have divergences, positive divergences building. And uh, I think we can get in here at the bottom of the wedge. Of course, the next buy trigger would be on a solid breakout above that wedge should prices find support here or just below. Remember, we have this gap right here uh, to look at. So that's DBA. And again, that's a broad-based um, comm ag commodity. Okay, this is corn, and this is the actual spot price of corn. This is on the uh, uh, stock charts. When you see the dollar sign here, that's these are the end-of-day spot prices. On the site, the official trade idea, because more people, you know, will have access to ETS, probably are more comfortable instead of trading corn futures, which is always an option for you. You know, I put on the corn ETF as the uh, trade idea, and on here, and this again, I believe I have a live link to this chart. I show two scenarios. I see the bullish divergences, just like on the DBA. I see these bullish, bullish divergences setting up. I see that MACD line starting to curl up there. I'm sorry, this is a PPO because we're looking at a weekly chart, so I have a PPO. So I can see some downside. And again, being at a weekly chart, if we do hit this you know, s scenario, which I'd give equal odds. I have two green arrows. The first green arrow shows a bounce from around current levels, and that's why I had the uh, corn trade as an active long. It's also still a setup. And I can just as easily see prices coming down here to this uh, support level. Um, 
a little below S1 and then bouncing. That would have, you know, we'd have this continued divergence. We'd have the MACD come down a little bit more and then the MACD turn up. We have the RSI right now at extreme oversold levels, rarely seen oversold levels. Uh, so that would, of course, go up as well and prices moving up. R1, you know, again, correlate this chart. If you're trading the corn ETF, you want to watch both charts. This is an end of day chart and my official price targets and exits will be based off the corn ETF and I'll keep that one posted. Uh, so R1 is the first resistance zone, R2 is the second resistance zone and more than likely that's where I'd see prices going up. We have a nice, this is a real, really nice uh, resistance area. We have a gap back here, you know, a gap over here, quite a few reactions. So over time, what I see is corn bottoming around the 350 area, give or take. We're at 370 right now, and ultimately working its way up, uh, you know, to the five, maybe the 550 area over time. This is wheat daily chart. Again, spot wheat prices uh, on the actual trade idea. We're using the ETF symbol WEAT. Um, and I showed this bullish falling wedge breakout. We had that nice initial rip. You know, you can see the resistance right here. It's not drawn on this chart, but uh, if I were to put a horizontal line, you know, you can see a lot of reactions right there. We hit that resistance, but so far we've made a higher low. And remember, this was coming off positive divergence here. We had positive divergence on the MACD. Uh, really what I call flat line divergence. You know, there's a, a flat equal lows on the RSI against prices making lower lows. And so far we've made a, a higher low. And obviously this would be a key level. So if we can see wheat, you know, power up, maybe a little reaction, pull back there and then bust on through uh, that 570 level, that would be bullish. On the weekly chart, let's see if I can access that real quick. You know, I have my concerns because I have this support zone that we're just below right now. I don't see positive divergence on the uh, on the PPO, although we almost have flatline divergence. A little bit of divergence here. We have a slightly higher uh, low on the RSI on the weekly frame. So that is divergence there. Um, you know, the next key support zone on wheat is all the way down below 400. So we'll keep an eye on these. You know, as I said, I'm not outright, you know, all in bullish on the ag commodities, but I do think it is going forward for the remainder of 2014 and probably well into 2015, one of the more promising uh, themes I think out there. And so I'm, I'm content, especially in my longer term accounts, scaling in right now, you know, with using somewhat liberal uh, stops and of course, keeping an eye on these charts. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. This is actually the longest video I've ever made. So for those of you still with me, congratulations <laughs> if you're still awake. Um, I'm going to talk on the coal stocks real quick, but I wanted to point out, again, my theme being selectivity with commodities. Uh, we're looking for right here uh, at this chart. This is the, um, the Dow Jones U.S. Aluminum Index. We're looking at a weekly time frame. So this goes back all the way to 05. You know, this is some... Um, pretty decent resistance right here. We have these, these two reaction highs that define this resistance zone. We've had a heck of a run up in, in aluminum prices. Uh, so for example, I mean, personally, a couple weeks ago, I shorted AA Alcoa aluminum, which is going to track. If you look at a chart, it looks almost, it's a mirror chart to the pr prices of aluminum. Uh, it still has to, you know, I happen to hit the highs. It was a speculative trade. I didn't post it on the site and I'm barely, you know, I'm up on it, but not by a whole lot. Um, it, you know, if and when this trend line breaks, I think there's a correction. You know, aluminum may go on over time to break out above this level, but we're very overbought. If you look at these overbought readings, I mean, gosh, we almost hit the 90 level, uh, this nearly straight up run. So here's an example of a commodity, and this is why I'm not buying broad-based commodity ETFs, you know, that, that cover metals, every type of metal, soft, hard commodities. Um, this is one that... You know, although it may power up, I don't see negative divergence on the PPO, uh, but again, very overbought at resistance. Uh, so I think the you know, it's going to at least at the very least have to consolidate here before it can punch up through that level, hopefully get a nice little pullback. Um, 
so that's just one example of uh, a commodity that's uh, gotten ahead of itself and doesn't look as bullish to me. And then finally, as recently discussed, you know, I have some coal uh, active, uh, some setups and active trades on the site. One of those just uh, was at a and I'm trying to remember, you know, missed the first target by a penny last week. Uh, it would have been about a 13% gain in just a couple trading sessions, and it still looks good. Um, so there's a couple coal stocks out there, some set up, some active trades. This was a coal sector, Dow Jones, U.S. coal sector, a weekly chart. And what I'm tracking here is this nice potential uh, inverse head and shoulders bottoming pattern. You know, we have a nice left shoulder here, you know, the head. And, you know, there's the head. And we're possibly putting in a right shoulder. Again, when I say potential head and shoulders pattern, it's because prices need to form that right shoulder. We need to, to see prices move back up to the neckline. Uh, at that point, the pattern is formed, and then, of course, we need the trigger. However, a lot of these individual coal stocks, they look, you know, uh, bullish to me now in the daily chart. You know, I own a few of these already, and I don't mind, as I often will, on a pattern like this, starting positions here and I wouldn't take it solely off of potential head and shoulders pattern again I'm looking at the daily chart and I'm looking at individual coal names because the coal sector you know there's just all there's different types of coal there's different types of stocks that are, fall under the coal sector some are railroad stocks that just their you know, primary uh, source of revenue is shipping coal across rail lines and then there's you know all, all different types and you know some of them are U.S. coal companies, and I have some that are overseas. So, again, there's a whole array of charts, some bearish, some bullish in the sector, uh, but one to watch. You know, coal stocks, to me, seem to be sold out. They're, they're coming off a vicious bear market. There was a lot of talk about how dirty coal is and, you know, the some of the implications that, uh, you know, we might have with, you know, regulations in the U.S. and abroad. Um, but, when you look at a chart at some point, you know, these stocks get sold out and, 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 the, and the sellers are exhausted and then you have a new set of buyers that come in and that's what technical analysis is all about. So again, something on my radar going into the end of the year, possibly for 2015 as long-term trade candidates. Because if this inverse head and shoulders pattern were to break out, these dotted lines would be, you know, likely upside targets, especially here, the 200 to 225 area. And that would be a, you know, a substantial move in the coal sector. Okay, this has been Randy Finney with the right side, with right side of the chart. Hope you enjoyed it.